Welcome to the Ashland Branch of the Pamunkey Regional Library for our program, Creating Backyard Habitat. I am Carol, your moderator for today. Our presenter today is Beth Farmer, who is the owner of Garden Gate Landscape and Design. She works with clients to help them incorporate native plants into their landscapes from small flower beds to full designs. And I'll add here that she's actually done a design for me, which hasn't been implemented yet, but it's in the plans. She lives in Caroline County with her husband, Bob, and two black labs. In her spare time, she enjoys gardening, hiking, golfing, and cooking. Beth, thank you for spending time with us today and uh, welcome. Thank you. Are the pictures gonna stay on here? Yes, until you change them. How do I do that? Um, just progress your slideshow. Okay. All right. Well, welcome everybody. Today we are going to, um, my program is going to be on creating a backyard wildlife habitat using native plants. Um, all right. All right. So um, what is a habitat? A habitat is a particular type of area where animal finds food, water, shelter, and nesting sites. We're going to talk about different um, native plants that you can bring into your landscape um, to create an ecosystem where living organisms can live, eat, and reproduce. Um, an ecosystem is the relationship between organisms and their physical environment. Um, our attempt in creating a habitat will be to mimic and recreate these physical environments within our landscapes um, that will attract and support more wildlife. Um, the more species of native plants that we can get into our landscape, the better the ecosystem. Um, you'll create and the greater number of species of pollinators, insects and birds and small mammals you will attract into your habitat. Um, the more you'll be creating greater biodiversity and, great, and biodiversity is the measure of life that um, can be found within an ecosystem. Um, so um, the first thing you want to do is take an inventory of your, of your um, plants that you have on your property. Many species that are sold and that we have been planting for generations are invasive species. They can spread or the seeds can be carried um, outside of your gardens and where they will not be in a, in a controlled environment and they can become extremely devastating to the environment. Um, Department of Conservation and Recreation has a web on their website a, um, a list of all the invasive plants in Virginia and these are just a few of them but um, if you go to their website, dcr.virginia.gov, under the heading Natural Heritage, you can find that, um, that list of them. But it's a good idea to find out what's invasive on your property. This is a good example of English ivy on the run. Um, you can usually spot old home sites because they have left their invasive plants behind. There's usually, there is actually an old house buried under all this ivy. Um, this is an area on the Rappahannock River. It's about a quarter of a mile long and it's full of ivy, vinca, white mulberry, and um, many other invasive species. Um, the only reason it's contained to the core of an acre is the rivers on one side and there is a, um, a field that's farmed on the other, other side. So you can see just how devastating the, um, the invasive plants can be. So after you've completed your plant survey, you may want to decide to remove some of the invasive species. And after the program, you may decide to remove some of, some of the plants you have to make room for some plants that serve a purpose um, and are more appropriate for habitat plantings. Next, you'll want to evaluate your planting sites. You'll need to determine um, your soil type, whether it's sand, clay, loam, or a mix. Um, and you might want to also check your pH. You can take a sample to your extension office and they can send it off and also have it tested for you. Then you'll want to check um, to see what type of light lighting you have. If you have full sun, part sun, part shade, shade. Um, and then last, you'll want to look um, for moisture where it's, if it's consistently dry or it might stay a little on the moist side. Um, if you have some drainage issues around your house, you might want to even consider a rain garden to take care of some of the, the water, the rainwater runoff. Um, in the wild, natural plant communities are formed based on plants needing similar conditions. Um, ultimately, it's best to plant natives that grow in the region of your state. I think it's 
um, important if you're restoring natural habitats to really use what grows regionally. Um, there's a book, The Flora of Virginia, that was took 11 years and lots of dedicated people um, studying and identifying um, every plant that grows in Virginia. Um, but there's the book, The Flora of Virginia, and they also have a website, Virginia um, atlas.org that's a digital version and on this you can um, get to the site you can look plants up by the genus um, or other characteristics and you can also look under your county and find out exactly what plants that grow in your county um, but this is a valuable tool when you're when you're landscaping and trying to um, establish your habitats um, there are a lot of different Regions around the state have come up with the, um, these beautiful little books. This is one from the capital, Virginia capital region, and um, they used to be given out for free. Now I think you probably have to pay for them, but the Virginia Native Plant Society has most of them that you can get just for a small fee, um, but it's, their website is vnpl.org, and um, but this gives you um, a lot of information on natives and tells you what plants grow more so in your region. But that's good to, to research when you're getting ready to start your plantings. So now that we've inventoried what's currently growing on our property and we're working on removing invasive species, you'll want to finish your, you finish your site evaluation and you know what type of conditions you have. You're ready to um, begin planning your, creating your habitat. When you're planning for your habitat, it's imp important to provide a variety of trees, shrubs, and pollinating flowers and grasses. And these you'll want to plant um, in vertical layers, um, starting with like your canopy layer, your understory tree and shrub layer, and then your perennial layer. And this will support all the different um, pollinators and birds and animal, animals um, for whatever, whatever type of um, habitats that they would need. But you'll want to include flowers to support the pollinators, um, plants that will seed, um, provide seeds, nuts, and berries, and um, plants that have ha are good for nesting habitats. You'll want host plants, and then you will want to provide a water source. Um, water sources can be elaborate, like um, koi ponds and fish ponds and water gardens, or just as simple as a bird bath. I like to, um, I have several like waterproof whiskey barrels, and I use them for um, water gardens and I use some of the native plants that like the water. Um, so, so what is a host plant? You'll hear me referring to host plants quite often. Um, the, <clears throat> let's see, with the native plants, insects are the basics, basic of the food chain and insects eat your plants. So you'll not wanna use any um, pesticides in your yard. You wanna just get over the fact that the insects will be eating your plants. Um, this makes, creates a very balanced habitat. Um, Lepidoptera is an insect order that includes butterflies and moss. And the butterflies and moss are very um, plant specific. They will only lay eggs on the plants um, that the caterpillars will be able to eat. So when I um, talk about host plants, these will be the, the plants that the specific butterfly and moth will be laying the eggs on. Um, the monarch is one of the um, the most the one that we hear of the most the relationship between the plant and the um, the butterfly. But monarchs can only um, eat milkweeds, and um, so you need to plant milkweeds for the monarchs. But that's a good example of the milkweeds being a host plant for the monarchs, and that's a caterpillar up in the top left. So now I'm going to get into a selection of trees and shrubs, and then perennials and grasses that are good for creating your habitats. Um, but if you have established canopy trees, that's really good because they're the slow growing ones that take, take a, um, a long time to, to get established. Um, but I'm gonna go over just a mix of different plants. Um, the pine trees, we have quite a few different pine trees that do grow in Virginia. They are um, one of your few great evergreens. The pine trees are host to 203 different Lepidopter species. Um, it's great for nesting. It's also um, the host plant for the imperial moth. And those are one of our giant moths. They'll get up to like five inches across. And then um, if you have some of these big, huge old oak trees in your yard, you're a really lucky person. It takes forever, like hundreds of years for them to get this big. But the oak trees, 
support 534 different species of Lepidoptera. Um, they're great for nesting. They'll get cavities in the trees that the birds and squirrels will nest in. And then you have those great acorns that the, the mammals and the deer will eat through the wintertime. And then holly trees are another one of our great evergreens and um, they produce berries if you have male and female. And um, they're great for birds, um, love the berries, especially the, the cardinals. These are um, some more of our great trees, the cedar tree. Um, some people consider them weedy, but I think they're beautiful landscape trees. They produce those, the females will produce those blue um, little um, berries and they're a favorite of the cedar waxwing. Um, the wax myrtle is another one of our great evergreen trees um, or shrubs. It's multi-stem. It can, you can let it sucker and um, just make a nice little habit. And it makes a great screen. If you have male and female plants, you'll get the wonderful berries on them that are, the birds will enjoy. Um, it is a host plant to some of the hair streaks and it's a great nesting, nesting plant. The arrowwood viburnum is a great all around plant. It can get up to 10 by 10 feet. It will take sun, full sun to full shade. It will take dry, medium to wet. So it's a very versatile shrub. Um, and if you have two, you don't need male and female, but you need two plants to cross pollinate and you'll get these big, huge berries in the fall. And those are a favorite for quail. The bottom left picture is hazelnut. I put a picture of the winter, of the fall foliage because it's, it's really spectacular. Um, the colors are really pretty pretty and it um, is a host for 131 different species of Lepidoptera and then you get these wonderful hazelnuts that are edible for people and they're also great for all the mammals um, that in the wild. Blueberries can be a great landscape plant. Um, there's lots of species that grow wild. We have high bush, we have low bush, there's deer berries and huckleberries and I've failed to, I still don't know, the, can't identify the different ones but um, there are a lot of ones that grow in the wild, um, but I, I wouldn't hesitate to use a cultivar berries if you want um, to add some into your landscape. Um, they can be smaller and compact, compacted. Um, they have beautiful fall color, and then you get the advantage of all the blueberries to, um, to eat, and then they're also good for the birds and the mammals also. Red chokeberries are um, a really versatile shrub also. They can get up to 10 by 10 foot. They will take sun to part shade. They're another one that will take from dry, medium to wet soil conditions. They bloom in the spring, um, beautiful white flowers that are great for the native bees. And then you have these beautiful red berries that will hold over through the winter um, that are good for wildlife to eat. Um, this one you don't need, um, it'll self-pollinate so you can have just one single specimen and still get the berries. And in the fall you have, um, it has spectacular um, color. So it's a pretty all season plant too. This I have switched, switched it around and we'll start with the, um, with the butterfly and work backwards. This is the spicebush swallowtail and it's the cat and it's caterpillar. It's my favorite caterpillar. I think it's really cute. Um, the, but these are some of the host plants that um, it, it'll lay eggs on. The sassafras is, grows wild throughout our woods. It likes to sucker and make little thickets. Um, in the fall, spring when it's blooming, it is full of these beautiful puffy yellow flowers. It's just spectacular. And it has beautiful fall color. And um, if you have male and female, you'll get berries on the female plants. Spice bush um, named because it is a host for the spice bush swallowtail. It also has a very fragrant spicy smell to the leaves. It likes to grow in uh, low moist places, um, part sun to shade, and um, it flowers early spring, tiny little yellow flowers. And then with, if you have male and female, you will get berries on the female plants in September, pretty red berries. And then the last one is the tulip poplar, which is one of our tall canopy trees. It's a fast growing tree. It has spectacular flowers that bloom in the spring. Um, the, unfortunately, they're always at the top of the tree, so it's hard to see them, but you usually can smell them. And this, this is a tree that will hold its seeds over all the way until the next spring or in late winter. So it's a good source of food through the winter time. 
The pawpaw is one of our most fascinating trees um, because of the tropical fruit. It is a big tropical fruit. Um, they grow that are delicious and people love to eat them and, and use them for different, different making anywhere from breads to beer, I think. Um, but it's an understory tree that likes to grow along the riverbanks and the low floodplains. And it is a host for the zebra swallowtail. And that's a picture of this um, butterfly and also it's caterpillar. It blooms in the early spring with these beautiful kind of dark red flowers. It is, a, um, it is pollinated by flies. So we've got many sorts of different pollinators. Elderberry is one of my favorite shrubs. It um, is big and sprawling. It blooms in late May, early June with these big panicles of flowers. Um, and then in the summer, you'll get these big droops of berries uh, that if you beat the birds to them, they're great to collect and use for jams and jellies, um, teas, tonics, and even wine. And it's also a host for the red spotted skipper or red spotted, um, red spotted purple. And all the parts of the elderberry are poisonous, but once you've cooked the berries, they are edible and, and good to use. But this can be big and sprawling, so you do need a, um, to have some room for it, but it also is a good, good plant for a screen. Now I'm going to get into perennials and grasses. Um, I have a lot of people I hear say that they have too much shade and they can't grow, they can't grow plants. But to me, the most, some of the most spectacular um, blooming natives are the woodland gardens. They, they're just beautiful. They have beautiful flowers and they're just spectacular. Um, so you can make beautiful woodland gardens. You can make English style cutting gardens that are big and full and over, overgrowing. You can make little mini meadows and you can do a meadow in any small spot that you have um, some nice sun. You can make a little mini meadow. And then there's, if you have some wetlands, bogs or swampy area, there's lots of great plants for that. And if you want something a little more formal in front of in the front of your house, um, there's some small compacted um, perennials and shrubs that you can use to, to even um, get that that look. So you don't have to be afraid of the natives thinking they're all going to grow big and wild and be crazy. You can achieve a lot of different looks with them. I'm going to start with the woodland gardens. Um, I've broken up the perennials into different little ha habits, um, whether they're sunny, shady, or, or the different um, soil moistures, because those are important when you're choosing your plants to make sure you have them in the right, right conditions, you'll get the, um, have them grow the best. Ferns are um, a great addition to the woodland garden. This is the Christmas fern. It's an evergreen fern. It, um, it likes more medium soil. It really doesn't like wet, uh, um, a lot of wet, and it'll, it is not particular on the soil type. So if you've got just a good shady area, um, that's, that would be a good fern for it. Green and gold is a ground cover. It spreads, it stays low. Um, it is evergreen. It blooms in the spring, but with adequate moisture, it can, with a little more moisture, it'll bloom throughout the summer, a bit of the summer also. Wild, col wild columbine is one of my favorite flowers. To me, it looks like a Chinese lantern. It's just really spectacular, but um, it'll be enjoyed by the early hummingbirds. Um, it, it'll take some morning sun, afternoon shade. It does not like rich amended soil. If you've amended your soil too richly um, with compost and, and um, this one will last a few years and then it, it'll just kind of disappear. But it's one that if it's happy, it'll recede and, and last for a good long time. The golden rods and the asters are some of the most important um, pollinator flowers to have in the late summer when, when all the bees and butterflies are really trying to stock up on the nectar and pollen. Um, so I've got a couple of them here. Some of the golden rods can take a fair amount of sun also, but I'm just, I put them in with the woodland gardens because they can be used in the woodland garden. And just to show you that you can have a good variety of plants that bloom in your shade also. The gray goldenrod is a favorite of mine to use. It only gets 18 inches tall, has a really big, large flower head on it. It doesn't spread, so it's really good for, for small gardens. It's going to be very well behaved. Um, the wreath goldenrod, the same. It's very delicate. It just has real slender, um, slender stems with the flowers going up the stems. And this one can take part sun, full sun, all, all the way to full shade. 
And then the sweet goldenrod is, um, can take full sun to like light part shade to light shade. And what I like about this goldenrod the most is the foliage on it, it has, a, has an anise scent to it. Um, when I finally found this plant, I spent like a whole summer like smelling goldenrods because I was determined to find this plant. But um, the Hartley Faster is one of my favorite asters. Unfortunately, unfortunately, it's a favorite of the deer also. If you have deer, you probably really don't want to plant this one. Um, but it can get up to like four feet tall, just covered in these little white, light blue, white flowers and looks like a snowdrift. It's really, really quite spectacular when it's in full bloom. These are some plants that will do well in a woodland garden that like a bit more moisture, all the way from kind of medium moist to wet. Um, another fern is the maidenhair. It likes really rich soils, um, kind of consistently moist, and it's, it's extremely delicate. It's a beautiful little fern. The Christmas fern is one that will make a bold statement. It can get up to five feet tall. Um, it'll take full sun to full shade and likes bogs and swamps. Um, it can take some drought, but if you have it in full sun, you want to make sure that it keeps some, some moisture all the time. The foam flower and the woodland phlox are two that I, I like to use together um, when, I'm, and when I'm doing woodland gardens. They both bloom at the same time. Um, they both are ever, evergreen, the foam, they, and they both spread, so they would be nice ground covers. But they do attract the early hummingbirds. The woodland phlox is one of the few um, wood native plants that has like a wonderful aroma. It's really, really sweet and, and um, smells great. Um, but these are two I like to pair together. The blue-eyed grass is actually uh, in the iris family. It's a really sweet little plant. It's a great value to the native bees. Um, it stays low, usually just about a foot tall. Uh, it's good for like rock gardens and, and cute little gardens, but um, it likes, moist to wet, um, but kind of average to poor soil. So it's not one that you need to have a good amended soil for. The golden rackwort is one I really like to use in when I'm doing designs for people that have um, moist gardens. It's evergreen, it does spread. If you have like a wet area that you really need to want to cover and soak up some water or that er does some a little bit of minor erosion, this is a Good one to use. It blooms in the spring, these pretty yellow flowers, and um, and the, the foliage stays really pretty through, also through the summer, as long as it keeps enough moisture. The white woodland aster is um, one that I've always considered to be a dry shade plant, but I um, have seen it growing in the woods along creek beds and floodplains, and so I did some more investigating on the digital atlas and found that's where it typically grows the most is along the wood along the creeks and the lower areas, but it also will do some dry. But it's a late fall bloomer. Um, it does spread, so it, it does cover. Um, it can be, it can reseed and, and spread aggressively or, or not. It just depends on, I think, your, what type of soil, how loose it is. Um, but it's a great, great late summer fall bloomer. Vines are some of my favorite. They can be a whole lot of fun. The passion vine, um, I'm obsessed with that flower. It's spectacular, but it is a host for um, the clear wing moth. No, I'm sorry. It's a host for the, some of the, one of the fritillaries. And when it's in bloom, it'll be covered with, with um, bumblebees. I've even seen the bumblebees sleeping underneath them at nighttime. Um, but it, it can be an aggressive spreader. It dies completely back in the wintertime, so you can cut it completely down and remove it and it'll start over the next year. Um, but it does send up runners um, underground. So you, it can it can be a, a nuisance if it's in an area that you don't want it, but um, but it's well worth, worth having because it's a spectacular flower. The Virgin's Bower, the Clematis virginiana, is a late summer into fall bloomer, um, beautiful white flowers. It grows wild on the edge of the woods or tucked into the woods, but it'll also do full sun if it has adequate moisture. But it blooms the same time as an invasive clematis, and so you really need to, to if you have some white blooming clematis at your house, you want to check, and um, you can tell by the leaves, the, the invasive one has smooth leaves and the native one has some cut um, on the leaf. But if you have the invasive one, it it's extremely invasive and you might that might be something you want to replace. 
And then the coral honeysuckle is, is a beautiful honeysuckle. It will fill up an arbor, but it will not take over like the invasive honeysuckle. It um, is also a host for the clear wing moth, um, but it's loved by hummingbirds and it's a really pretty vine. Wetland natives are, um, if you have some wet boggy plants uh, places or even the swampy places, these are some good ones to have. The turtle head is a late summer bloomer. Um, the hummingbirds love the tubular flowers. It can take sun to part shade to full shade, um, likes in kind of medium to moist all the way to wet. Um, but it's a great one and it's a host for the Baltimore checker spot butterfly. The cardinal flower and the great blue lobelia are both lobelias that will take full sun to part shade. They um, like meet kind of medium moist all the way to wet. They grow on like creek banks and river banks or in low wet meadows. Um, but the cardinal flower especially is a great attractor of the hummingbird. If you have those, you'll definitely have some hummingbirds. Um, the, the last four are, the next four are emergence, and those are plants that can be temporarily or, or um, consistently emerged in the water. Um, they can actually live totally immersed in swamps or in ponds or rivers. Um, the Virginia iris is an early spring bloomer. I have, um, I use those in some of my water gardens, but they're really pretty when they're blooming and uh, make a great, great um, water, or a great water plant. Rose mallow is one of our native hibiscus. It can grow in medium garden soil all the way to totally emerged in swamps, um, but it's a great attractor to hummingbirds and is a later, kind of later summer bloomer. Pur purple pickle, pickerel weed is another of our great um, aquatic plants. It grows um, on the edge of ponds and lakes, um, completely submerged in water, um, as well as the lizard's tail. Now we're gonna to get to some of our sunny meadow plants. Um, I first picked out some that like moist to wet. These, a lot of these also can take some just regular garden soils as long as they're not completely like, um, like drought conditions. They can take like medium garden, medium garden soil moisture. Um, but the swamp milkweed is one of the Asclepias that are uh, a host to, to the um, monarchs. It can get like four, about four feet tall um, and it will do well in a medium garden setting all the way to wet. But um, it's really, it's a really pretty, one of the pretty milkweeds. Um, the green-headed cone flower is one of our rutabecchias. It is an aggressive plant. It can get up to like six feet tall and it is a great, and it spreads a lot. If you have a larger area that you would like to cover, it's a good one to use. Um, it's a kind of a mid to late summer bloomer and um, it's good for the um, it, the birds will love the seeds and as well as being a great pollinator. But it'll it'll also grow in just kind of medium garden soil also. Sneezeweed, I think, is a really cute flower. If you have allergies, that's one you probably want to avoid because it will really make you sneeze. Um, but it'll grow in medium garden soil all the way to, I've seen it growing on the, um, the banks of the Rappahannock, where it's actually submerged in water at high tide. Um, but it's a sweet Flower, um, great for attracting lots of pollinators. The New York garden weed can get up to eight feet tall, so you, it's great in the back of a garden or if you have a, a low damp meadow, um, but it, a beautiful purple color, but it's a great late summer pollinator and then it holds the seeds over a um, long time into the winter time. So it's a good one for uh, providing food through the winter for the birds. The New England aster is, um, it's one of my favorite asters also. It can get up to four feet tall. It can flop over, but when it does, it kind of flowers up the stem. So you end up with just a large mound of beautiful flowers. Their flower colors are anywhere from pink to violet. Um, this one can take full sun to light shade and kind of medium moist all the way up to wet. And then Joe Pye weed is um, a couple of different species that grow in Virginia. This one is the fistulosum. Um, it can get up to like eight to 10 feet tall. It, um, this one in particular can take anywhere from dry, medium to wet um, conditions. And when it's blooming in the late summer, it'll be full of swallowtails. It's a great pollinator. These are a few more of the, um, the moist 
plants, the false aster, which is Baltonia asteroides. It's another one that is an aggressive spreader um, underground and also by seed. It um, can get probably five to six feet tall, but when it's blooming, it's just full of those tiny little daisy flowers and it's really pretty. And um, it's, it'll be covered in bees and butterflies. The mist flower is um, one of my, another one of my favorites. It gets like three feet tall. It is an aggressive spreader underground and also by seed. Um, but if you have a place you want to cover um, that's um, damp and kind of shady, I know still grass is one that that's a problem problem for a lot of people in those areas. This is an aggressive one that probably would be good to plant to. Um, to try to cover ground to keep out the invasive plants or weeds or to keep out weeds also. But if this one will take dry, medium to wet conditions and full sun to full shade. Um, but grows best and the most aggressive in like part shade and a little bit on the damp side. Um, on the right, we have the obedient plant and it can take kind of medium all the way to, to wet. The, the wetter and better conditions it is, it's in, it, um, the more aggressive it'll be spread. But if you have a place to let it spread, it's, the flowers are just spectacular and it'll be covered in bees and um, hummingbirds also love it. And it's a later summer bloomer. Culver's root is, I think it's a regal flower. Um, it has those beautiful candles. It gets up to five feet tall. It's really pretty in the back of a garden. And it will, likes to grow in the area on the edge of the woods where you have some sun, some shade but it will also do like full sun. Um, but it's a great plant to have and it's a real real high value for bees. The scarlet bee bomb, um, the Monarda didyma is one that grows more in the western part of the state. Um, but it, it does well here, but it really, it likes really rich soil, um, can take moist all the way up to wet soil. And um, uh, over here on the outside the mountains, it would probably prefer a little bit of shade. Golden Alexander is also considered a woodland plant. It can take um, some light shade. It also um, will take full sun. I have it growing, but it, it likes more moist soil, but I have it growing in a hot afternoon sun and sand. And um, this spring, this is a picture out of a garden beside my greenhouse. It was just spectacular. Um, so I was really impressed with with the conditions I had it in. I don't have shade so and I have sand, so I try to stretch stretch the conditions on some of the plants, um, but a lot of them are, are extremely versatile, even though they might have ideal conditions. But this plant is a host for the black swallowtails, and I had some by the house that had caterpillars on it last week, so I was really excited to see those. Well, bergamot is a Monarda fistulosa that it grows kind of scattered through the state, but more so on the western part of the state, but it's just a trooper. Um, I, Whatever type of conditions I've ever planted it in, it's thrived. It stays more in a clump. It's not a huge spreading monarda um, unless you have really soft amended rich soil, and then it might be a little bit of a problem, but um, it's one of the highest for, foraged um, pollinator plants. You'll see more different species of of different pollinators on this, probably more other than the mountain mints, those have more, um, but it's a really beautiful plant and I love to watch the pollinators on it. The horse mint, which is also ca called spotted bee balm or um, Monarda punctata, is a beautiful Monarda. The flowers grow in tiers. It'll, it'll be covered in little sweat bees and lots of little pollinators. It's a, the plant grows mostly in the coast, it grows a little bit up into the eastern part of the Piedmont, but it is one that does not like clay. I've tried to grow it in clay. Now that I'm in sand, it's it's spectacular this year. Um, but it this is one that it doesn't um, spread. It'll it'll grow in clumps, so it's a good monarda to have if you have smaller gardens. The oxide sunflower is um, just a good all around. Steady, steady plant in a garden. It gives a nice bright pop of color. The um, goldfinches love the seeds. It starts blooming usually in like mid to late June and it'll, it'll bloom throughout the season. So um, it's a great, great plant to have. Rutabecchia herda, the black eyed, is the, the true black eyed Susan. And then also Rutabecchia fulgita, the orange cone flower. They're um, very similar in appearance, um, both Rutabecchias. The herda is one that grows more 
In the meadows, it can be considered weedy. It's a shorter lived perennial, um, but it, it's a real heavy cedar. I have this out in the meadow and it, it's seeded very abundantly, but it's not one you probably want to have in a, a garden, that's a smaller garden that you want to keep neat. Um, but the Rutabecchia fulgita, fulgita is a little better behaved. It, it's um, a longer lasting plant, but it, it doesn't receive as heavily as the herda. So that's a better one in a small garden. Um, I have two liatris. They, the scaly blazing star um, has little pom-pom flowers. Um, it's a really sweet little flower. It um, likes to grow in like open woods or, or meadows. So it's one that will take full sun to part shade and likes drier conditions. Um, the blazing star, I takes, it will take like medium, medium moist all the way to moist. I put this one with the drier condition, just to compare the two um, liatris. But the what you see that you can buy in the, most of the nurseries is the um, kabold, the cultivar kabold. But these are great, both great pollinators. Um, the last one I have on the right is the nodding onion, and it's a sweet little plant that the the head of it not turns upside down and when it blooms. It's this one's range grows more so in the mountains. It likes kind of rocky soil, um, but it's growing beautifully in my sand. Um, but I try to use it around my liatras because they say voles don't like onions. And I've heard if you plant vol, um, onions around some of the plants that the voles like, that it'll, it'll keep them from eating them. Um, I've had, I'm not sure how that's working, but I know the scaly blazing star is a favorite of rabbits. So that's one I've been still having problems with trying to keep growing. These are a few more sunny meadow plants. The world coreopsis and the yarrow are two that will take sunny, hot, and dry. They have long bloom times. They start blooming kind of early to mid-June and will bloom throughout the summer, repeat bloom through the summer. Um, they like crappy soil, so um, you don't need to worry about amending the soil for those. The sunny meadow plants, there's, most of them are later blooming plants. So the blue star flower and the false indigo are some great spring bloomers. Um, the blue star flower is the Amsonia. It has a, a really true blue flower. Um, it blooms in like late April, May. The foliage will stay really pretty through the summer. So it, it also has a, a nice presence in your garden. And then in the fall, the foliage will turn kind of gold yellow. So it's actually a three season perennial, which you don't always get. Um, and then the false indigo is in the pea family. It can get up to like four foot, four by four foot and has these beautiful pea-like flowers and big black um, seed pods that'll stay on it for, um, through a good bit through the summer. And this one puts down a really deep tap root. So it will, um, it's very drought tolerant and can take some really good hot sun. The aromatic aster is not one that grows in this region, but it's, it um, does very well here. Um, better in loose um, soil than heavy clay. I didn't have real good luck with it spreading in clay, but it's a ground cover. It will spread. Um, if it's real loose soil, it, it might spread a good bit, but um, it's one I like to use on the border of gardens and sunny gardens because it gets only three feet tall, but you can shear it back, cut it back in like late June, early July, and it'll uh, make just a, um, a nice carpet of these beautiful flowers that bloom like late summer into fall. These are a few of um, the milkweeds. Um, you don't, there are I think 12 different species of um, Asclepias, the milkweeds that do grow in Virginia, not all of them local to this area. And a lot of them are hard to find in the um, nursery trade. Mostly you'll see the, um, the tuberosa, the, the Syriaca, the common milkweed and the swamp milkweed. Um, once in a while you might be able to find the purple, that one's a little, little harder to find. But the, the Asclepias tuberosa and the Syriaca, like, like sunny, hot, and dry, the tuberosa um, stays, um, only grows about 18 inches tall and doesn't spread. So it's a great one for smaller gardens. The common milkweed, uh, I've heard it called a garden thug because it does send up shoots and runners all over the place and can take over an area. But you just need to put it in an area that and just let it grow. Um, it's a spectacular plant, um, huge, big 
white purple flowers that have like a vanilla scent to them. And then the purple milkweed is one that likes a little bit richer moist soil and can take some part shade. The pygnanthemums are mountain mints. Um, they're a species, um, they, these are three of the more common. There are some others, but um, most of them have a wonderful minty scent to them. They will attract more different varieties of pollinators, I think, than any other plant that grows in Virginia. Um, so they're all, they're, um, it's, they're some good ones to have in your garden. The clustered mountain mint likes, prefers kind of moist to medium, um, but it'll also take some dry conditions and anywhere from full sun to part shade. It is, it can be an aggressive spreader if it's happy. Um, they don't have big showy blooms, um, big brilliant blooms, but they're very showy plants. Um, they just when they're blooming, they're very quite spectacular. The narrow leaf mountain mint can take anywhere from moist all the way up to dry conditions and from full sun to part shade. Um, this particular one stays more in a clump. I haven't seen it spread. Um, the clump gets bigger, but it, I haven't seen it spread outside of um, the clump to, to be too aggressive. And it, it's the only one that I know of that does not have a minty smell, but still attracts lots of pretty pollinators. And then the Ori Mountain Mint has the biggest cluster of flowers and it can get up to five feet tall. And, um, and it grow, likes to grow on the edge of woods, edge of the woods, but it can take full sun also. Now I've chosen a few grasses. Grasses are, are great to have in um, your landscapes or on your property. Um, they're great for wildlife. They're great for nesting for birds. Um, the birds also eat, will eat the seeds through the summer or all, and some of them hold seeds all the way through the winter time. So um, these are good to have, especially for the birds in the winter time. Usually right before a snow, the birds know to feed heavy. And um, that's when I see a lot of activity in, in my grasses but they're also host for some of the little skippers, butterflies also. But the little blue stem is a great one to use in landscapes. It only gets up to about three feet tall. It uh, doesn't spread unless it um, reseeds some and it really has a pretty blue green foliage to it. And in the fall, the, um, the grasses turn like yellow and red. They're really pretty. The purple love grass, um, only gets like a foot to two feet tall and when it blooms in the late summer the seed has, seeds have a purple tint to them so it's a really attractive plant and both the little blue and the purple love grass can take like just sunny hot dry conditions. The Indian grass is probably my favorite tall grass. It can get up to five feet tall. Um, it, the, it seeds out in late summer with beautiful golden seeds and um, it's also a great nesting nesting and um, the seeds for the birds. The bottle brush grass is a woodland grass. Um, I've spent some time in the woods helping my husband survey the, this past week and saw this a bit in the woods. It was more um, a little bit open section in the woods where it got a little more light, but it can also take some heavy shade. But it's real um, small and not aggressive and the seed heads are really pretty, but it usually gets like two to three feet tall. The panicum grass is, can take sun to part shade to light shade and it can take dry, medium to wet. It's one that's a little more floppy. You, um, but in nature, like in meadows, the, the grasses kind of support the flowers and the flowers support the grasses. So if you are doing a meadow or even a mini meadow, this is a nice grass to include because it just kind of fills in all this and softens all the places between the flowers. And it's really pretty. The sedges are kind of your workhorses. They, um, they, there are a lot of different types of sedges. The top set, top on the creek sedge likes um, wet areas um, for its name, the creek sedge, and it also will take shady conditions. This is a great plant that's a good um, a good um, one to use instead of monkey grass, the liriope, um, in your landscapes, but it stays in a clump and it is evergreen. The Pennsylvania sedge is likes dry conditions. It can take some part sun all the way to shade. 
this one's used a lot for lawn alternatives. If you have a shady spot where you can't get grass to grow, um, it probably wouldn't like a whole lot of foot traffic, but if you have a place that you just want to cover that's not like a main lawn, um, it's a good one and it does spread underneath the ground. So These are just some pictures I've taken um, in my gardens and um, when I had the nursery and I'll just go over them real quick. The top left is the Buckeye butterfly. Um, the host plant for that is a Ruellia, one of air wild petunia, um, but it's a sweet, it's a smaller butterfly, but it's kind of a mid-sized butterfly. The bottom picture is their tiger swallowtail. Um, as you can see those a whole lot. It, the tulip poplar tree is a host plant for, one of the host plants for the tiger. The top middle is the silvery checker spot. It's a little butterfly, um, really sweet. Um, the bottom is the caterpillar for the silver spotted skipper. Um, the first year I grew Amorpha fruticosa, I noticed the leaves curled up. So I went to open a leaf to see who was in there and that's what popped out. Um, but it, I think it's a really, really cute, cute caterpillar. And then on the right is on the common milkweed is one of our fritillaries. A few more pictures on the top left is one of our um, swallowtails. Some of the tiger swallowtails, the yellow ones, some of the females have a, um, a black stage, so I'm not sure if this is one of the female tiger or, or um, one of the black swallowtails, but they're one of our larger butterflies and really pretty. The, let's see, the caterpillar is the hickory horn devil. I forget the butterfly right now, but it's one of our giant, uh, or moth, it's one of our giant moths. It's like five feet across, but my husband saw this caterpillar. I was out of town and he was so excited, but it, there, it's like four inches long. So it's really quite, quite a showpiece, but I thought it looked like something out of a Dr. Seuss movie. When you're doing um, habitats, um, especially if you have water gardens, you're going to attract a lot of frogs. When I was in Montpelier and I had a lot of shade and it was damper and wetter, I had so many different frogs. But um, even here, and when I moved to Caroline County, I'd have them that lived in, in the greenhouse. They would burrow down in, in the trays of plants, and but frogs eat bugs. So if you um, don't spray your plants for for bugs and just let the nature take its course on um, the frogs will be in there eating lots of bugs. And then the bottom picture, that's actually the um, aromatic aster and it'll be loaded with bees. I think there's a honeybee on there. And this is a um, Monarda fistulosa. Um, when I did this, this was a video, but I couldn't get the video to work on my, on my, um, my laptop, but it just shows you all the different species. I was just fascinated with this particular, this plant. Um, plant. This was when I was in Montpelier, this one got part, this particular Monarda fistulosa got part shade and it just bloomed and bloomed and bloomed because it didn't dry, it didn't get, um, have a heat stroke, but it was always full of um, the hummingbird moss and all types of bees and, and butterflies. So it was like, it was fascinating just to sit and watch. Um, but that concludes my program. And now if we want to do some, um, if there are any questions. Okay, I've gotten a couple of questions I think I've taken care of for you. Uh, and one is, can the native region, or can the Regional Native Plant Society Native Plant Guides be downloaded? And I've shared a website there with a whole listing their brochures that can be downloaded. Okay. <laughs> Huge number of them there. Uh, and another question was, will the presentation be available later on? And, and yes, it will. It's being recorded and will be posted on the library website. And I put the address in the, in the chat box for everyone. Uh, we just have to give our tech people a couple of days to pull it together and get it posted. Um, another question I can't, or another question for you to answer, Beth. Uh, can native grasses do well with occasional mowing? Um, yes, we, we have uh, fields of native grasses and my husband keeps some of them mowed all the time. And, um, and I mean, they'll, they'll just grow right back up, but it doesn't hurt them to, kill, to mow them at all, so. Okay. Um, um. This question, I have Japanese stilt grass growing in my woods. What can I do? 
My pawpaw and persimmon doesn't fruit. What's wrong? My service berry has rusty spots on the fruit. What gives? There's a whole slew of questions for you. <laughs> okay. Um, the still grass, you need to pull, 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 um, bag it up and throw it away. Um, they, the seeds are viable in the soil for seven years. So once you've gotten rid of it and you don't let it seed, you will still have it coming back for quite some time. Um, but what you can do is get some natives in there planted on top. Um, some of them that like the moist that spread aggressively and that'll help con control the area. Cause uh, I know in some of the um, invasive species removals, um, you remove one species and you have fresh dirt and then the, like the stilt grass moves in. So it, it can be very, very much of a problem, but um, the best, the only way to really get rid of it is just to pull. And then let's, let's say the oh, persimmons are not fruiting. Um, I know the pawpaws take, can take up to eight years um, before they will bear fruit. So I'm not sure how old they are. Um, persimmons take quite, I'm not sure how many years that they do take, um, but they do take, do they have, but I know you need the pawpaws, you need um, two trees from different genetics. Um, if, if they came from the same place, if they were seed grown, they're going to be different genetics. But if they were taken from cuttings or cultivar, cultivars, they would be the same genetics. So um, you do need different genetics. The persimmons, I'm not sure about. I've read different things on those and, and still confused on if you need male or female, if they're male or female plants. Um, I've read different things, so that I'm not quite sure. But... And their service berry has rusty spots on the fruit. That, they're also in the, the family with like the apple trees that can get like the cedar rust, I think, on them. Um, so that's that's probably what's called, it's called, if you have cedar trees around, it's, it's probably um, from this, the rust from the cedar trees. Mm -hmm. I think it's more a blight, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. And what would you do for that? Um, Beth, it's cedar apple rust. My service berry gets it all the time. Okay. And I engage a tree service to spray a fungicide on them at the appropriate time. And it does allow you to at least get the fruit on it. Sooner or later, it will still get infected, but it does allow you to get the fruit on it. It's called cedar apple rust. Okay. And it's a fungus. Okay. Yeah, yeah I was close. I knew it was. Yeah, thank was... you, Linda. Associated so with the apple trees. Okay, thanks, Linda. Um, someone else has uh, a leaf rod on the dogwood and it says about 75% of the tree. And she wants to know if she can save that tree or does she need to just get rid of it? I would probably get rid of the tree. Um, there's a, I think it's a virus. I'm not real good with viruses and diseases, but, and fat thracnoids, I think, um, which has killed a lot of trees in Virginia. Um, but it, it's very, it's a big problem with, with the dogwoods mm -hmm. and I'd probably take it out and just replace it with something else. Um, red buds are a great, great, um, a great choice. Fringe trees. Um, there are a lot of other trees that are native that probably are, are not going to be a problem. Okay. Uh, question. My five, foot tall Monarda fistuloso fell over and broke from heavy rain. Can I cut it back and will it rebloom re this late? I, I would try to cut it back. Um, I had a conversation with somebody else about this last week and I told them just to experiment and find out. So I'm not sure if it would, it, I've heard that if you cut it back, the Monardas that they will rebloom. So I would give it a try. Someone's asking where to get a pawpaw tree. Um, hmm. There are, are some native nurseries or, or people, just small native nurseries in, for, in the Richmond area um, that I know a couple of them do have pawpaw trees. Um, if they want to email me later, I can probably send them a list of those and give them connections. Get, okay. get give them the websites or email addresses to get up with them. What's the best way to remove English ivy? Um, dig it up and pull it. Um, I know if you like mow it and weed eat it, it stunts it severely and it's easier to get in there after that um, and get it pulled up and dug up. 
But um, if, it, if it's on trees, you want to just cut it and you don't want to pull it off the tree because it can damage the tree. Um, but if it's on the ground, just digging and pulling. Okay, here's one. Uh, I have a sunny area about 20 by 30 feet that is currently unplanted, aka weeds. If I wanted to begin a small meadow, what would be your recommendation of species to begin with? Recommend the species? To begin with. Um, hmm, sunny meadow, um, I would do some, the rutabacchio herda um, is a great one. It, I mean, if you want to do seed, you can prep the soil and like get it tilled up and um, up, do the seeds and the, um, the winter time. But rutabacchio herda, I would do some of the milkweeds. Um, I would include probably the Monarda fistulosa is a great one in a meadow. Um, some you know, grasses that I would, depending on if you want tall grasses or short ones, the little blue is, little blue stem is a great um, meadow plant. Um, there's a lot of them, let's see. Coreopsis verticillata is a great one. Um, okay. But, but if, she wants, if she wants to get my web, my email address and send me an email, I can give her a list. Well, you've got it on your slide there, so they can take a screenshot of it right, yeah. right now and yep. uh, have your information. Okay, uh, is it possible to plant native meadow plants that will in time take over where wire grass currently reigns? I, wire grass is pretty, pretty tough. I don't, I think I would try to get the wire grass under control before you try to make the effort to put in, put in some plants, spend the money and the time and the effort. Okay, in Western Hanover, this is an important question. Are there plants that will help break up the clay soil? Um, hmm. I'm not sure about breaking up. I, I lived in, in Western Hanover for many years, and there, there are a lot of them that do well there, um, um, that spread like the Rutabecchia laciniata, the large one. Um, it spread it's still spread nice in the um in the red clay i had a monarda it was a cultivar raspberry wine and it was very aggressive in the clay um so um but I, as far as breaking up the clay uh, um, i'm not sure if they i mean they're ones that will survive in the clay well but I'm not sure about the breaking up, breaking it up. Okay. Usually you need to dig and, and try to, I used to just amend it with some compost. Um, I know they don't always recommend amending for the natives, but um, but I have sand here. So I, I add compost just to help hold in some moisture. And then when I was in Montpelier, I would dig and dig and um, I added a lot of compost. And you could see over the years where it was like sifting down into the soil and which made it a, a lot easier to work with and, and richer. Okay, this is, this is going to be the last question. Okay. Uh, this person is planting a meadow on a new home site. They plan to plant clover this fall before doing the meadow. Is that a good workable idea? Um, clover is great for the bees, but are they doing just um, the white clover? Or, uh, Sarah, would you like to speak up? I said yes, just the white clover. Okay. Um, I, I've heard some things about not planting clover and I'm not sure, sure why. I know it's not native. Um, I probably wouldn't put it in the same place that they're going to, to put the meadow. I would maybe do um, just a, an annual cover, cover crop or something for the winter. Something like ryegrass? But yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, um, we, we are slightly over time, so um, we're going to come to a close now. Beth, that, that's been a wonderful presentation. And for all of you that are interested in following up, um, it will be posted on the library's website within a few days. Uh, thank you all for coming. And um, I, I'm glad you're here. And we've had a Great presentation and uh, look at the look to the library's website for more 
presentations and great topics coming up. Um, I, again, our website is uh, www.pamunkeylibrary.org. And uh, there, there are always new things popping up. And so keep an eye on it. Um, so thank you for coming and enjoy the rest of your day. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I enjoyed doing the program. Bye. Bye-bye.